Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IDEA Data Center presentation on the norms of collaboration, strategies for working together effectively in person and virtually. I think that ties the record for my longest webinar title. And one of our norms today is pausing, so I'm pausing for laughter because I think we should kick off with a joke. Uh, my name is Dan Mello, and I'm happy to be joined by my longtime colleague and excellent facilitator, um, renowned facilitator. If you haven't worked with her yet, you should, Susan Hayes. Thank you for joining me today, Susan. Um, Thanks, Dan. We'll, cheerio, we'll have an hour together today, and um, we're going to be talking a little bit just in an introduction about the webinar logistics. So we just wanted to cover the basics. We want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. We want to um, let you know that we are recording this webinar and you will be able to uh, find this uh, recording on the IDC website, which I'll show you in just a second. During the presentation, except for uh, uh, particular moments, we'll be muting all participants. So we welcome you to type your questions or your comments into the chat box. And uh, we'll remind you, as always, that at the end of the webinar, there will be a brief online evaluation that we will ask you to complete so that we can best meet your needs in the future. Uh, if you haven't been to the IDC website recently, I just wanted to cover that uh, we do provide an archive of all of our webinar recordings. Um, on a specific page in the resource library, and you could also, there's a handy search function, you can uh, do a search for norms of collaboration, and uh, this presentation will come up. Next, we will review the agenda, where we will begin by uh, identifying and naming the intended outcomes of our webinar today. We'll provide an overview of the norms of collaboration will provide an opportunity for breakout sessions, small group discussion, where you'll identify challenges that you're currently facing and potential solutions using the norms of collaboration to move forward. Uh, we'll come back together, we'll share out, um, and then we'll have a, a moment to plan to take action and move forward. I'm gonna pass it over to Susan now, who, did I just cover your agenda, Susan? Sorry about that. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> you covered it well. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Susan Hayes. Dan, I will pay you later for that lovely introduction. <laughs> um, and want to return the favor by saying everything I know about the norms of collaboration, I've learned from Dan Mello. So you all are in for a treat. You're here with the expert. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. We know how busy everyone is, um, how hectic schedules are, so we are honored and privileged that you chose to spend an hour of your time with us. Um, but building up the agenda that Dan shared, um, our outcomes today for this session is we hope at the end of the hour you will be familiar with the norms of collaboration as well as understand how practicing them can really enhance group work. Um, and as Dan said, we're also going to push towards application and we'll have an opportunity in some small breakout rooms for you to think about how you might apply the norms of collaboration to your work moving forward. So this is our goal uh, for, for the next hour. And if we go to the next slide, Dan. Thank you. We wanted to um, give you a moment to think about the concept of norms of collaboration before we dive in, trying to model one of the norms that you'll hear about in just a moment in terms of pausing. So we invite you to, in the chat box, share any thoughts that you have about why establishing and using norms of collaboration when working with others is important. So I will pause and give folks a moment to share their thinking in the chat box. Thanks, Elizabeth, who says it makes the workflow more efficient, absolutely. Carolyn chimes in that it provides consistency. Thanks, Dana. Everyone needs to be heard so we don't miss any great ideas. What a great, great point. Cassidy says it avoids confusion and helps document decisions. Absolutely. Um, Becky's saying to ensure the group understands and is working toward a common goal. Patricia providing opportunity for all. 
um, Emily, make, making sure everyone is able to understand the goals. Oh, coming fast and furious now, I won't be able to read all the names. Uh, thank you all so much for contributing. Um, I'm seeing it's important to establish norms to have everyone on point and give everyone a process. Absolutely, make sure individuals feel connected, that everyone's working as a team, an agreement that it provides consistency, common understanding. What a beautiful collection of rationales for norm setting. Um, so thank you all. Please continue to chime in in the chat box. We might want to capture this as something we could use moving forward because it's a really nice summary of all of uh, the various reasons that setting norms is important. So thank you all. I think before we move on, I just wanted to mention too, um, you'll hear, it's in the title of this event, this phrase about norms of collaboration, but wanted to mention that there are other ways you can think about characterizing this concept. We've heard people refer to the norms of collaboration as community agreements or collaboration tools or principles of collaboration. So I think the language is less important than the concept, which again, you all have really captured and summarized beautifully here in the chat box. So thank you for that. And with that, we're gonna dive into the norm. So I will pass it back to you, Dan. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> I will advance the slide. We'll just take a few moments to provide an overview and looking at the clock and just checking my time. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I wanted to start by saying that the norms of collaboration uh, are, are seven in total, uh, and they are tools that we can use to uh, communicate and collaborate effectively. We asked that same question to IDC staff, and they believe similar things, that norm setting outlines clear expectations, ensures everyone is on the same, same page, reduces misunderstandings, sets a tone for the meeting, acknowledges and honors all voices and perspectives, brings focus to the issues uh, that the group considers most important, helps groups settle in and prepare for the work ahead. I think these norms also address the human needs. I mean, we're talking about collaborating over content, but really the norms are tools that make us feel like people, uh, people working together to advance our common ideas, to make progress in our thinking. So, I also wanted to mention that the norms of collaboration are based in uh, research that came out of the 90s. Uh, these, are, these are they, the uh, pausing, paraphrasing, putting inquiry at the center, probing for specificity, putting ideas on the table, paying attention to self and others, and presuming positive intentions. And since 1999, a few of these have um, been substituted or replaced, uh, but basically concepts, as I said, to, to make us feel heard, respected, um, really to move, um, this is a big concept for me, it, it moves the locus of control in a collaborative group toward the center so that one person isn't dominating and no one is feeling left out, which I think reflects many of your comments. So these norms or these tools for collaboration were de developed, as I said, from a research base in the 90s. Much has changed since then, and we are looking forward to seeing how the norms change and adapt to meet new opportunities for virtual collaboration and also allow change um, to promote true collaboration of diverse groups by honoring all voices. I have, uh, I think, the honor of tackling the first norm here. Um, so we come to the, the first norm of collaboration, and it's, it's pausing. And uh, pausing uh, requires that members engage thoughtfully in conversation by taking time to think and reflect before responding. We've put up on the screen here a few different ways or types of pauses. Uh, we can uh, add one more bullet point pause for laughter here. but. Um, I wanted to say that it does require a slowing down, um, a listening, a weighing, and this is ways that we communicate, we communicate a whole lot about our intent without saying anything, but in fact by pausing. We acknowledge the other person in the room or people in the room that we're considering the weight of what we're about to say or what they have said. Um, so we, in person, um, we think about pausing. You've probably done this in meetings, just 
the in-person facilitator will uh, ask the group to pause and reflect. So there will be an in-person quiet time. Um, when we think about a virtual environment where we don't always have eye contact because our camera is up here and you know the video screen is over here, um, anyone could be doing anything. Um, we think that pausing is important because it is one way to build trust. It's we one way to build trust is by honoring each other's pauses to give time for people to think. And if it makes you feel more comfortable, I think in the virtual environment, no one's quite sure when you're done, you're done speaking. So go ahead and name that because we're lacking a little bit of the in-person uh, visual cues here. So you could just say, I'm just gonna pause for a second. I wanna complete this thought, but I just need one second. And I think that everyone would just go ahead and honor that. I pass it now to Susan to discuss paraphrasing. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. And I'll say, too, we're going to walk through the first three norms here and then give you all a chance to sort of react and respond um, before going through the, the last four. So paraphrasing, I don't know how many times this has happened to those of you um, on the line, but I love when I have a question about something that's happening in a meeting and somebody else stops, pauses, uh, asks a question, or perhaps paraphrase, and it's so welcome because in my mind I'm like, oh my goodness, I had the same question. Um, so paraphrasing really is that. It's a strategy for both checking your understanding about what is being said or discussed, but also giving that opportunity for others to learn from the clarification that you're seeking. Um, so if we go to the next slide, there are a couple different facilitation strategies that you can use to paraphrase to aid in understanding, again, both for yourself and others, um, stems like, I think what I'm hearing you say is, or you're suggesting that, in other words, or it sounds like you're saying, and then you would repeat back in your own words sort of what you took, the meaning that you took away from something that someone shared. Um, one way to do this, so much of what we'll be talking about um, in this hour today, are the application of these norms of collaboration in a virtual setting because that is our uh, reality these days that all most of the work we do, if not all of it, is virtual. So one way you can do that is um, I've seen folks take notes on the screen as a group is working so you can really track what's being said and you might interject as a participant and say, okay, I, I see what you just wrote is X and I have a question about that or can you can you further describe or you might paraphrase what you see there. Um, it's also really important that the paraphrasing be as accurate as possible. As Dan just mentioned, we're not face-to-face, -face, so we don't receive those in-person cues that you receive when you're sitting across the table from someone. So really checking to ensure that your paraphrasing is on target is important in a virtual setting because you might not know unless you ask specifically. Back to you, Dan. Thanks, Susan. Um, the paraphrasing is just so important. Um, it's it's just one way to respect our colleagues by saying, I hear you. And because this is a technical conversation, I'm just going to demonstrate that so that we can all be certain of it. The next norm of collaboration, and I think the third one before the break, um, before we discuss, is putting inquiry at the center. So in a collaborative spirit, um, we're we're inquiring into our own and others' ideas before we sort of advocate or uh, even discuss. Um, before we weigh, we must make sure that we have a full understanding of, of the thoughts on the table. So we've put a few things on the on the slide here for you to think about exploring uh, together before um, before making those big decisions, before moving the conversation forward, we can think, we can explore um, the perceptions of ideas, the assumptions that underlie uh, the beliefs as well, and uh, thinking about and really clearly stating interpretations if it's a bit ambiguous. So we're pursuing a little bit of a balance between advocacy and inquiry throughout our um, collaborative uh, enterprise. And this is certainly one step that should not be skipped. So if you wanna be effective in your collaboration, um, 
we've got to refrain from pushing on our personal agenda agendas and question not only other ideas, but also your own, I think, yeah. moving that locus of control to the center. <clears throat> um, we become really vulnerable when we do this, when we uh, put an idea on the table and then we question that very idea. So it is a matter of extending your trust. I think, you know, and, and trust being a factor that underlies um, this collaboration or any collaboration, I think it's a little bit difficult to build in a virtual sense. So on the left here, we have some possible sentence starters that you could use. Um, but if you're in the, the virtual setting, again, you're missing these um, non-verbal communication cues that are just so important. So I think the, the best we can do is to name, hey, I just want to share this idea, but I also have this question about it. Um, you know, what, what assumptions am I making that I might not be aware of? So. Go ahead and moving forward with uh, putting inquiry at the center by making yourself a little bit vulnerable and welcoming others to uh, challenge your beliefs, assumptions, your ideas. Thanks, Dan. So next, we want to sort of check in with the group. I was going to joke around and say, now it's time to do norms of collaboration role play, which we've done in the past, but we're not going to make you all <laughs> engage in role play. But we did want to give you a chance to sort of react and reflect on the three norms that we've shared up to this point. Um, so thanks, Sophia. If we go ahead and launch the poll, we're curious, out of those three norms that we just talked through, pausing, paraphrasing, and putting inquiry at the center, and yes, they all start with P's, uh, to try to help us remember, which of these three norms do you feel that you use most consistently or naturally in your own work? Is there one of these three that you think, you do a pretty good job of this, it comes pretty naturally to you when you're working with others? So we'll give you a second to respond to the poll. Okay, I'm interested to see the results. It'll be interesting to see if there's sort of a winner here um, as one that most folks feel comfortable with or if it's sort of spread across the three. So it looks like most, 43%, uh, which is the largest percentage of our participants feel that they paraphrase most consistently or naturally, and then it's sort of evenly split 15% of folks, I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone <laughs> in the challenge of pausing um, and putting inquiry at the center. So thanks for that. We're going to move on, but I will also invite you, if you have an example, um, we invite you to, to share this in the chat box, if there are any examples of a time where you very intentionally remember using one of those norms and it was helpful to a group. Um, it's really nice to make these norms come to life with real world examples. So. I'll, I'll put that out there. I'll put that on the table. Um, if you'd like to share a story in the chat box, please feel free to do so. Um, but in this um, spirit of staying on time, we can go to the next slide, and Dan and I are going to walk through the next four norms um, and then give you a chance to respond and, and reflect and react again. So our next norm is the concept of probing for specificity, and this is in some ways sort of an extension of the paraphrasing norm in that you're uh, seeking clarification. So it should be honest and open-minded and should really come from a place of wanting to both understand, clarify, and maybe move the conversation forward. So if we go to the next slide, we'll give you some examples. So again, these are sort of entry points for probing for specificity or stems that you can use to phrase this for your colleagues. You know, please say more about, or I love that I'm wondering whether I'm wondering about, can you tell us more about, do you have an example of? Um, and when we're working virtually, if it's a group where everyone's unmuted, you know, you could, that could be part of a verbal conversation. It could also be something where you use a chat box. So if someone's sharing and you want to, again, probe a little bit to make sure you really understand or help expand the thinking, you could start off a comment in um, the chat box with one of these stems. Dan? Thanks, Susan. Really solid pause there uh, earlier with the poll. Thank really you. Happy. <laughs> it, was, it was tough for me. I had time to reflect. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, I think you're right, the paraphrasing and um, uh, putting ideas on the table. 
or I'm sorry, probing for specificity. Um, can you imagine probing for specificity? I think if if you haven't just paraphrased, could look an awful lot more sort of contrarian, I guess. If if you hadn't acknowledged that you understood the person, that person might fear that their idea has been lost if you're mm -hmm. just moving forward. So I think those two go together really well. Um, so in effective collaboration, we encourage that group members understand there are many possible solutions to uh, any challenge or opportunity and a variety of ideas need to be considered. Um, perhaps you move forward with one or two, but acknowledging the sort of the world of opportunities allows um, a more comprehensive uh, analysis of, of tackling a challenge. Um, and what we wanted to think about with putting ideas on the table is that it's equally important to take ideas off the table. Um, when we get into the, the uh, very, um, a group that uses the norms of collaboration very often, they do move that, once again, locus of control toward the center and all ideas are honored. And so if you, if you sort of leave your idea on the table, um, it sort of has to get carried forward. And I think that there are opportunities to make the work go more smoothly. If you're ready to take your idea off the table, go ahead and name that. Um, go ahead and allow the group to release that, uh, put it in a parking lot, um, et cetera, because we don't need to carry it forward if we don't, if we don't need to. Um, so for putting ideas on the table, you know, these are just some sentence starters here. Suppose we tried, one approach might be, again, you'll see that there's not any real advocacy here, any personal advocacy. It's a suggestion for the group uh, to consider. Uh, and it, I think if we name it in person, one way we just name it on your, on your call or in your virtual conference, um, name it by using these stems, uh, name it by, you could say, I'm ready to take this off the table so we don't have to think about that anymore. And when you use the chat box, um, I do suggest as well, if you, you know, are holding onto an idea, if you put it down in the chat, um, put it down with that qualifier. You want to say, I don't mean to interrupt or something like this, but when we have time, I want to also consider this approach, um, or, you know, you can do the same by taking it off the table. Passing it back to Susan for paying attention to self and others. Thanks, Dan. Um, so my short summary of this one is just being a good human. Um, I mean, I think all of these are in some ways, but paying attention to self and others, you know, first and foremost, really trying to track how you are being received by others, your comments, your behavior, your contributions, and then also really trying to stay in touch with the room, um, which can be challenging when it is a virtual room. Um, but just, again, trying to sort of keep a, a sense of the vibe in the room, how folks are feeling, um, if we go to the next slide, we can give some examples of what this looks like, both in person and in vir a virtual setting. Um, but trying to address a variety of learning styles and needs by providing a variety of activities, and also just giving different ways for people to share their opinions and for voices to be heard. So there might be individual reflection time, which is a great way to, to pause. You could have people share just with one other person, or have small group activities. A round robin share out ensures that each and every person has a chance to speak. Um, again, thinking to different learning styles, you can also put forward some text um, or even some data and give folks a chance to respond. Um, also just making sure you take consistent breaks. So attending to a variety of learning styles, attending to just the needs that we have as, as, as human beings. So thinking about sort of carrying some of those strategies forward into the virtual environment, again, wanting to be really conscious about breaks, it is very hard. I don't know if any of you have read the article, I think it was in the New York Times about one of the reasons that video conferences are really taxing is that it's very difficult for the brain to track eye movement and body language um, through a screen. And so it is very draining and recognizing breaks are needed as a result. Um, again, you can use technology to try to emulate some of the various activities in the left-hand column, whether it's pausing for reflection time, sharing some text or data for folks to respond to in the chat box, 
putting people in small groups, et cetera. This next bullet also just really wanting to build trust, which can be challenging when it's a virtual space, but creating that time for some informal connection and relationship building. Um, I think it's also, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, it's hard to stay present. Back to that article about sort of the cognitive load of tracking in a virtual space. So I think it is completely acceptable if you missed something to say, I'm so sorry, my, the mailman arrived and my dog, of course, needed to go attack the mail and I missed what you said, can you please repeat? And also if you're the facilitator, just sort of keeping tabs on how folks are feeling, gauging when a break is needed. Um, or not being too offended if, if, if someone checked out for just a minute because we're all juggling things in our backgrounds. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dan. Thanks, Susan. Uh, we're coming to now our last norm. And before we cover it, I just want to say that, you know, while these norms are based in, in the research, in, in our translation to the virtual space, we really just thought as a team about you know, what are the effects of practicing that norm? What are the, why do we do it? Um, what are the underlying principles that, you know, the, the trust humanity that really are communicated using this norm? And we try to come up with some ideas for um, translating that to the virtual space. And you know, I think that there's a lot of room to grow here. So I look forward to working with everyone on this call um, in the virtual sense in the coming months and years to develop these out because I think that they are really needed because this work is hard. Uh, lastly, we've come to presuming positive intentions and essentially while we may disagree in the long and short of it, while we may disagree with a colleague, the underlying sentiment is that they believe that the intentions of that person are positive. So I want to add a caveat here because I think it's a little subtle. Um, I'd like to clarify that this norm should not be exercised reflexively. Uh, in the linguistic sense, I think, but so I'll state just as clearly as possible that we must presume that others have positive intentions, uh, not that since our own intentions are positive, that we should not be concerned about the impact of our, uh, of our own words. So by taking responsibility for ourselves in this way as collaborators, we can allow for open conversations and then, um, you know, in those times where things are a little bit difficult, where things are in question, we can use the other norms such as paraphrasing um, and paying attention to self and others to challenge ideas together and move forward in, in the collaborative way. Um, <clears throat> so when we presume positive intentions, we can use these stems. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and then we get into how it, how the impact uh, has felt. Um, so for the virtual environment, this is this is one that is a very interpersonal skill. That when you're in person, I think we all sort of do it naturally when we um, relate to one another. Uh, we connect with that person. We use people. We, we make eye contact. We um, assume a certain posture to. Um, extend yourself into a place where you want to communicate that you think everyone's doing their best to move forward together. Um, a little bit difficult in the virtual environment for those same reasons. Um, the, just the, the enormous amount of energy it takes. So we, we sort of strategize that using someone's name is really nice uh, in, you know, if you use in the right tone. Um, and it just calls attention to that person as uh, a person, an individual that, you know, that you're working together in a group, but everyone is an individual. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Susan for another poll. Thanks, Dan. And I've already shared with you all that I am always working on pausing. That is my weak spot. Um, so we wanted to pause here and have another poll and have you all tell us of the four norms that Dan and I just walked through. So probing for specificity, putting ideas on the table, paying attention to self and others, and presuming positive intentions. Uh, sort of what's your Achilles heel? Which of these is the most difficult for you to remember or use consistently? So sort of curious where, where the group is and, and, their, and their feelings about their ability to use these four norms on a regular basis. And Cassidy says in the chat box, she answered presuming positive intentions, but also working on pausing. <laughs> I'm with you, friend. <laughs> 
and Lisa too. All right, we'll form a little support group for all of us folks who are who struggle struggle to pause. Yes, and I you're right. Um, Lisa saying that she gets caught up in how much there is to cover in a limited amount of time, especially when meetings are often scheduled for just an hour now, you know, on Zoom or WebEx, and so there's that little bit of pressure and crunch. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm with you, ladies. And let's see, so it's kind of a mixed bag. So 21% of folks, that's the largest percentage, feeling like probing for specificity is a norm that maybe doesn't come as naturally as the others. I think putting ideas on the table, no, excuse me, Yes, putting ideas on the table um, and presuming positive intentions. There are fewer folks who, who struggle with that or find difficulty uh, applying that norm. And then paying attention to self and others is about 18%. So thank you all for being vulnerable and, and sharing with us uh, what you're working on. Um, and I'll give it back to Dan and we'll give you a chance to sort of dive in and, and discuss uh, both successes and challenges in more detail in our breakout rooms. Thanks, Susan. Um, love to see those poll results. The um, at pausing on the phone, it's it's really a challenge because there is just especially without any camera activity at all, you just don't know, and then people end up pausing and talking over each other. Um, if a if a strong facilitator could sort of choreograph a little bit of or be intentional about stating that they're pausing, I think that I wonder how how calls might be improved. Uh, we're going to have a breakout activity with small group discussion. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that you're facing um, in your in, well, in your virtual collaboration um, and identify some norms <clears throat> uh, to move forward. So we have a few discussion prompts and the facilitators for each breakout room are going to have this slide which has each of the norms of collaboration on them so that uh, we can be reminded about uh, some solutions that might help us move forward. Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. Sorry for that interlude. That was fascinating. What was your analogy, Dan, the matrix? You yeah. Like here. <laughs> here. I was like, Ann Salter, second matrix reference in 24 hours. That's funny. Yes, Becky. Was, I was like, oh, this is totally how my brain feels sometimes. There are 18 different conversations. Or have you seen that joke about like all the tabs are open and you can't figure out where the music's coming from on your computer? And that's how your brain feels sometimes. Um, so thank you all for sticking with uh, that little technical glitch and um, hopefully having some productive conversations in your small group. Um, we just want to take a couple minutes, and I don't, I'm thinking, Sophia, right, folks are muted. If you'd like to be unmuted so you can chime in over the phone, maybe just raise your hand or let us know in the chat box. We'd love to hear different voices. I'm sure you all would love to hear different, maybe not all at once, but I'm sure you'd love to hear different voices. Um, so please feel free to chime in verbally, or you can can use the chat box, um, but just curious if anyone would be willing to share a highlight from the small group, either a challenge you've experienced um, working virtually, or in our group we ended up talking about some successes that we've had. Um, so anybody willing to share in the chat box, or again, let us know if you'd like to be unmuted, and we welcome you to join us verbally. So challenges you've experienced working virtually, maybe other than sheer exhaustion. <laughs> Um, and and or any successes you've experienced. Good morning. Um, yeah, it's barely nine o'clock here where I'm from. I'm from the small island of a, a small territory of American Samoa, and so we just discussed in our small room chat. I mean, small chat room. Most of the challenges that we experience virtually is just the connection itself. Sometimes when we connect with um, technical assistants off island or um, other colleagues that are not able to come back home um, just for work purposes, it tends to break up. Um, we don't receive the information on time. So there's always a delay in time and um, messages sent. However, there has been success for us on our side using um, Google Classrooms, and, and I also mentioned to in the in the um, small chat room that we also use FaceTime on um, Skype, Facebook because it was much more of a clear connection to connect with our colleagues as well as our students. Because I also um, teach 
um, after hours. And so most of the time I'm using um, Moodle to try and get assignments out for everybody. And um, I just saw one of um, our colleagues mention um, Jitsi Meet. We also use that and it's amazing. So yeah, that's what I just wanted to share with everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. I never heard of Jitsi Meet, so thank you for sharing that. And I think your point about connectivity, we think about that norm of paying attention to self and others. Paying attention to others just may mean is everybody that you expect to be on the line on the line? Does everyone have the tools, the technology tools that they need to collaborate? So I think that's a really important point. Um, and I think, is it Kaylin? I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly, Kaylin. A positive is the rollout of Microsoft Teams to everyone there at their department. So that's great. There may, maybe that's a tiny silver lining from this experience that everyone will become much more adept and at working virtually and using the same platforms. Um, Vera, thank you for sharing this that they discussed in their small group how to better probe for specificity. And sometimes that means setting the team expectation that everybody's going to share um, and to be prepared to share your thinking. I, Appreciate that. Audrey saying that the group felt challenged by the outcomes of the meetings that you could maybe walk away or hang up <laughs> with different understandings about outcomes or follow up tasks. I think that's a really good point. Um, and thanks, Fred. It's more important to do frequent check ins, polls, uh, et cetera, when you're in this virtual space because you really can. Um, it's hard to track when there's not any potential to collect sort of nonverbal feedback, uh, even with webcams, absolutely. And presuming positive intentions isn't always easy. Yes, you're right, Vera. I think that's that's a, a, a an important point, and I'm glad glad you raised it. It's 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 challenging, um, and but hopefully that through this conversation today, we all recognize the importance of trying to keep these norms in our in our mind at all times. But absolutely, it can be really hard, especially if you're tired and you're on Zoom call 17 um, for the day. So. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan to close this out, but want to thank you all for your thinking, for engaging in the small groups, um, and for your perseverance and kind of working through that that little moment when we all had to break and hear all the voices. <laughs> um, <laughs> go ahead, Dan. All right. Thank you, Susan. I was just thinking about the challenges of internet connectivity. It seems immense, um, and I, I, you know, I've been switching back and forth between virtual and in person, and um, that is a thing that's particular to uh, to the virtual collaboration. It's as though if you were in the same room collaborating, like there would be a like a very loud noise that would prevent you from actually speaking to each other, or like a jackhammer outside or something, um, and you'd have to seek a different solution because every it, it really can undercut, I think, some of the the collaborative efforts that um, that are sometimes challenging, made more challenging by um, you know, that's just the inability to communicate. So um, we're going to wrap up here. And uh, in the spirit of self-improvement, improvement of your teams, I'm asking you to identify one norm that you plan to commit to incorporating into your own work moving forward. Uh, we're always curious about uh, what people are focusing on, what they feel is most important for them. <clears throat> um, I'll give it a, just a second, I'll pause for a moment in the presentation for you to provide that probing for specificity, presuming positive intentions. Another for, uh, while well, those two just, uh, two votes for those, putting ideas on the table, pausing. These are, um, these are big ideas that uh, are synergistic. They all work together. The sum is greater than the parts here because when you use them together, um, just like a really special thing happens, I think, that uh, not any one person can do by themselves. Um, the group acts together using these tools. Um, one thing we didn't get to do today was practice our norms, which is something that seems kind of silly because you're modeling a goofy conversation, but we just wanted to say sometimes this stuff is hard and um, using a practice model, um, you know, just trying out some of those sentence starters is really excellent way to become uh, more versed in the norms of collaboration. Um, practice with a colleague, um, practice at home with your family, 
I'm not responsible for the consequences of your collaboration, but uh, I think it's just, it just feels good to get the stuff down and make it work right. Um, and lastly, this is like developing work. Uh, these are just our ideas that we're drawing from the research on. Um, I'm, I would just ask you if, if you've got any insight on virtual adaptations for these norms, I'd certainly want to hear them. Here's uh, my contact info, please send them to Susan as well so we can think about them as a team. Um, we're going to wrap up now with a, an evaluation, and I believe the questions will appear on the right. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over for the evaluation. Ditto. Thanks, everybody.